I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and it's time for some ASAP Frontline. Today, once again, returning to the Tennessee ASAP meeting, symposium and annual meeting from March 7th, 2024. This particular session with Jordan Rupp, MD, on ocular ultrasound, unlocking the posterior chamber. Some of the other skills we can do with the ultrasound at the bedside with emergency medicine. So Dr. Jordan Rupp from Tennessee ASAP 24. We've made it. I'm the last lecture. We're almost uh, to the end. Thanks for hanging in with me. And, um, you know, seats aren't necessarily the most comfortable, so thanks for sitting just a little bit longer with me today. Um, my name is Jordan. I'm the fellowship director for the Ultrasound Fellowship uh, at Vanderbilt, and I'm going to talk to you about ocular ultrasound today. I do curate just a uh, some images for visual DX, but that's not gonna affect anything I talk about today. I'm gonna jump into a case. So imagine you're leaving here, going to your next shift, and you put your bag down, sit down at your computer, log in, click on the first patient uh, to start your day, and it's eye pain or eye complaint. Gives you a little bit of the shivers maybe, I don't know, maybe it's just me. Um, 40-year-old male, flashes and floaters in the right eye. What are you going to do? So you're going to get the five vital, vital signs of the eye. Just do an external evaluation of the eye. Who's going to bust out the slit lamp? Otoscope. Anyone use an otoscope thus far this year? Matt Lipton, thank you. Uh, who's just going to call off the right away transfer um, or just call the ophthalmologist to have him seen the next day. What's our differential diagnosis? What are you guys thinking about? Retinal tears. Retinal tears is the big emergency with, with this chief complaint. What else is on your differential? So, vitreous hemorrhage, vitreous detachment, maybe optic neuritis, ocular migraine, maybe just migraine in general, um, but you know certainly Retinal tears is the big diagnosis that we're worried about. So I know as I was going through residency and just starting out, I felt really comfortable with everything on the anterior surface of the eye, in the anterior chamber. I felt okay with the slit lamp. But everything in the posterior chamber was a little bit of a black box, a little bit of a mystery to me. Uh, and so ultrasound, when I was exposed to it uh, as a resident, really helped unlock the posterior chamber. And so I hope to give you all some tools today to better evaluate uh, these ocular symptoms, especially related to the, to the posterior chamber. So we're just gonna talk a little bit about how do we do an ocular ultrasound and do it safely. And then if you've never picked up an ultrasound probe before or you have limited experience, I'm gonna give you two diagnoses that I think you can walk out of here today and, and um, potentially make on, on your next shift. And if you do have some experience with ultrasound, you feel pretty good about it, I'm um, gonna talk about some more advanced diagnoses, uh, especially differentiating a vitreous hemorrhage and a vitreous detachment. Hopefully, uh, with the light coming in um, from the back of the room, we'll be able to see the images okay. So let's talk about the mechanics. Really wanna make sure that we do this safely. So number one, the kind of non-starter would be any concern for an open globe, we don't do an ocular ultrasound. I think about the eyeball kind of like a, a bottle of toothpaste. If my two-year-old gets a hold of it, if he squeezes out that toothpaste, there's no way it's going back in. So same, if you press on the eye, eyeball and vitreous comes out, you're not going to be able to put it back in. So I don't want to be putting extra pressure on the eyeball. You're going to want to choose the linear probe, high frequency. This structure is really easy to image. It's a bag of fluid that's really superficial. And so um, the linear probe is perfect for that. We're going to want to set it to an ocular setting. So um, your device rep should have put in some exam types that will help you image the eyeball safely. So it's going to have a low thermal and mechanical index as not to um, cause any, any damage to the eyeball. You're going to want to rest your hand on the, on the patient's forehead. So I usually use my fourth and fifth fingers to, to rest my hand as kind of a kickstand and rest my hand on the patient's forehead or the bridge of their nose so I'm not pressing in on their eyeball. 
Otherwise, you can have a little bit of an ocular cardiac reflex. You don't want to have a patient pass out because you're pressing in too hard. The eye's already uncomfortable. Um, wipe down the probe thoroughly. You can use a tegaderm over the patient's eye like they have here. Um, sometimes you can get air trapped underneath, you know, but the advantage is you don't get gel into the patient's eye. I've started just using a, a probe cover on the probe itself just as that added layer of protection. And then use a nice uh, amount of gel so that you're just resting the probe in the gel and, and not on the patient's eye. A gel pillow, so to speak. So coming from Vanderbilt, I swear we don't, we don't ultrasound every patient in the department. It's not all we ever talk about, but it just ha so happen to be the three lectures today. Uh, but what I'm talking about, resting your hand on the patient's bridge of their nose or on their forehead, you want to, what I tell our residents is anchor down. So that's the way I want you to remember it today. So anchor your hand on the patient's face and not just smashing in on the eyeball. Here's what we're going to see. Hopefully projecting OK. So our probe is at the top of the screen, probe markers uh, to the left side here. This is going to correlate with the probe marker uh, in your hand. And then we can see the anterior chamber very nicely up front. You can actually see the iris coming through. The lens sits just posterior. And then all of this is the posterior chamber. And then the retina is obviously adhered to the posterior aspect of the posterior chamber. We can see the optic nerve coming in posteriorly, and you can even see the intraocular muscles um, coming off on the lateral aspects of the eye. So retinal detachment, this is going to be that um, high stakes diagnosis that we can make in the emergency department. And this is really uh, obtainable, even walking out of here today. You're just going to look for a thick hyperechoic rope in the posterior chamber. And it's going to be kind of flapping in the wind. The mental picture I have is some CrossFit. I don't know if anyone does CrossFit in here. I don't know what this exercise is called. But this is what I imagine every time I see a retinal detachment is the, the thick hyperechoic rope just flapping uh, in the posterior chamber. It's always going to be fixed in two points, you know, in the CrossFitter's hands and on the wall or whatever. Uh, and a lot of them look very similar to each other. So this is what we're actually seeing is that retina should be adhered posteriorly, and then it lifts off, um, and we see a retina, retinal detachment. It should never cross the optic nerve. It's continuous with the optic nerve, so it should never cross that point. And then uh, very frequently, it is detached all the way up to the aura serrata, um, which is a more firm uh, fixation of the retina at that point. So, seems like a huge majority of the retinal detachments that I review in QA or uh, find myself look exactly like this. So here we go. So you know, here's where the retina should be adhered in the posterior chamber. Here's our optic nerve. And you can see that retina hyperechoic thick rope in the posterior chamber. And it's just flapping in the breeze. You can just imagine our crossfitter um, getting his workout. This is actually the same patient. So you'll notice it goes a little bit horizontal on the screen. And this can be confusing at times. But we don't have the optic nerve in view. So I'm going to go back. So the, the second image, we're actually ultrasounding through this plane. And so we're catching the retina right here. And so it can sometimes show up parallel across the screen, transverse. Um, but we want to make sure that we fan all the way through the eyeball to find the optic nerve. And then we see, oh, it is actually inserting posteriorly. This is a retinal detachment. Another example, you know, good image recognition. Put the probe on a, a patient's eyeball. Maybe the next time you have a patient show up in triage with a loss of vision in, in one eye, and you can maybe save a stroke alert uh, doing a, a very quick ultrasound and, and making the diagnosis. So another example, again, you can see posteriorly you know, still attached at the, at the optic nerve. This one's just a, a little more subtle. Hopefully, you guys can see it uh, in the back of the room, but another retinal detachment. All right. 
22-year-old male, this is your next patient, 22-year-old male coming in with monocular diplopia. So what's your differential for monocular diplopia? Psych, 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 maybe a lens dislocation. So a rare diagnosis, but um, if you are already going to look for uh, posterior pathology, fairly easy to pick up. What we're going to look for is the lens just hanging out in the posterior chamber where it shouldn't be. So normally we want our lens you know, sitting just posterior to the iris. We're picking up a little bit of hyperechoic in this view. And then as we scan, the same patient have a nice round football just sitting in the posterior chamber. Um, so lens dislocation. Another example, uh, just a still image sitting in the posterior chamber. All right, so at this point, we're going to elevate the level of complexity. Maybe you have a little bit of experience uh, doing some eye ultrasound. We're going to try to tell the difference between uh, vitreous hemorrhage and vitreous detachment. So a couple key points, things that I use to help differentiate. For vitreous hemorrhage, I'm going to typically see hyperechoic material hanging out at normal gains. So around that 50% level, if, if your machine gives you a, a percentage of the gain, it's going to tend to settle more posteriorly. So gravity is just going to help it settle to the posterior aspect. And then when I do ocular motor testing, which means got my probe on the patient's eye, their eye is closed, I ask them to move their eye back and forth. The, the schmutz, for lack of a better term, is just swirling in the posterior chamber as opposed to a vitreous detachment where now that structure is lifted off the back of the eye anteriorly towards the probe. I'm only really going to see it when I have the gain cranked all the way up to 10. So this is the, the one time where I tell my residents, hey, okay, you've scanned through at normal gain. Now turn the gain all the way up to where it's offensive and scan through the eye, and if now you're seeing um, hyperechoic material in the posterior chamber, and it's gonna, this could be a vitreous detachment, especially kind of swaying back and forth, described as uh, sea, seaweed uh, swaying, you know, in and out with the tide. And this might be a little bit of blasphemy, but uh, Dr. Lipton gives this good advice, and I, I think it's good, but, uh, or great. So if you're really unsure, at the end of the day, you can use an otoscope. And if you take a look and all you see is blood in the posterior chamber, that's really going to help you differentiate. Um, so just a really nice piece of advice to, if, if you're really struggling to, to tell the difference. So let's try to make some diagnoses. So this is our mind ray gives us uh, the gain setting, so we're at 53% gain. And patient's moving, their eye back and forth, uh, maybe a little something back there. And then I crank the gain now all the way up to 99%. And now we see this hyperechoic material. It's lifted anterior. And so this would be a vitreous detachment. Here, our gain's already up to 69%, not really seeing much in the posterior chamber. So we crank the gain all the way up to 11. And uh, now we see hyperechoic material swaying to and fro uh, with the tide lifted off anteriorly. So again, another vitreous detachment. Gains midway, 53%. And we see hyperechoic material already um, pretty well in the posterior chamber. It's settling a little more po posterior as opposed to that vitreous detachment that uh, was lifted anteriorly. Again, our gain's still at 63, and we, we see all this hyperechoic material just setting in the posterior chamber. And so this is a vitreous detachment. Remember, the most important thing with both vitreous 
detachment and vitreous hemorrhage is they, their association with early retinal detachments or maybe uh, very subtle retinal detachments. And so um, even if we make these diagnoses, especially vitreous detachment is relatively benign, they still need an ophthalmologic evaluation 24, 48 hours um, just uh, to reassess that, that risk of a, of a small retinal tear. And this being a decent example, really hyperechoic uh, retina back here may be starting to, to detach, but um, you know, seeing a vitreous hemorrhage in the posterior chamber. Gain 58%, see this hyperechoic material sitting in the posterior chamber. Here we've turned the gain way up, but still have a fluid level sitting posterior, so vitreous hemorrhage. How, how well can we do this? So this is a study looking at uh, 225 patient encounters, 75 independent providers, residents, uh, practicing physicians, APPs, and uh, prospectively collected at four different uh, facilities. Our ability, and by the way, only training, 30 minute uh, lecture. Yeah, so you guys can walk out of here and uh, with the skills, pretty good uh, sensitivity and specificity for a retinal detachment. A little bit um, less sensitive and specific for a vitreous hemorrhage, uh, vitreous detachment, which I would argue is you know, m more benign of the three diagnoses. We're not nearly as sensitive those that know what they're doing uh, have quite a bit of confidence at, at calling it. And so um, with a little more skill, we can make this diagnosis a little more readily. Um, but this is something uh, that we can definitely do. So a little tight on time, but try to move through some cases. What do you guys see? Yeah. So this is a lens that had an artificial lens that had been put in and uh, detached. So it's very hyperechoic uh, sitting in the posterior chamber. This is actually the same patient. You can see the lens coming in and out, but had a little bit of hemorrhage with it. So not seeing much on this view. So I'm gonna turn the gain all the way up as high as we can go. Now we have, sorry, I know the glare is pretty uh, coming from those uh, back windows, but you can see that the vitreous has become dehydrated and detached off the posterior aspect of the eye. And so a vitreous detachment. Doesn't cross, it crosses over the optic nerve and again, lifted anteriorly. Pretty normal gain, 64%. Fair amount of hyperechoic material in the posterior chamber. Vitreous hemorrhage. What do you guys see here? So I kind of hear some mumbling. Our, our gain set at 73, so just a little above normal, um, but, and seeing some hyperechoic material in here. And then we also see, as the patient moves their eye, a pretty, this is one of the more subtle retinal detachments I've seen. Um, and you just see as they move, it lifts off the posterior eye. Um, and so you can just see the continuum of disease where if that vitreous does detach, occasionally it takes um, the, the retina with it so they can occur uh, together. So here we're seeing that retina lifted off posteriorly and then with some associated hemorrhage. Obviously, most important to, to look for the, for the retina and then assess for the other findings. So 
Major take home points, we want to scan the eye safely. Make sure you're on an ocular setting. Clean the probe thoroughly. Anchor down, so rest your hand on the patient, uh, not pressing into the eye too much, and have a nice gel pillow to rest the probe in. Retinal detachment is going to be that hyperechoic line that's um, fixed in the posterior chamber uh, in two points. Lens dislocation, we're looking for that round structure uh, just hanging out in the, in the posterior chamber. looks like a little football sitting back there. Uh, vitreous detachment, um, only going to see at really high gains. It's going to be lifted anteriorly, acts like seaweed moving in and out with the tide, and then vitreous hemorrhage is going to be seen at near normal gains and going to tend to settle more posteriorly. So. Dr. Jordan Rupp from Tennessee ASEP 24 with ocular ultrasound unlocking the posterior chamber. Wonderful conference. If you get a chance to attend it uh, almost every year in Chattanooga, Tennessee, had the opportunity to speak there as well. A wonderful group of people and a great chapter. So if you get a chance, check it out. You can contact me, rstandardasep.org, rstandardasep.org, and at Everyday Med on the X Machine. Until next time, I'm Dr. Ryan Stanton, and this has been some ASAP Frontline. If you're not on the front lines, you're on the sidelines. Cue the music. Bam, bam, bam. Bam. Quiet place. All yeah. alone. Da, da, da.